videos, that's one of the things you're looking for, is what's intensely personal, what's universal, what's shared, what are the things, mom, 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 a shared idea. What's common? When you go through these videos, you're going to find things that come up a lot. How many of you in your description, when we were talking to the person next to you in your head, mentioned something about flavor? Come on. This would be the signal. Yeah. The hand thing, right? Can I choose? Hello? Flavor makes a difference. How many of you, when you were thinking about this, thought about something in relation to when you ate the meal, whether you ate it with your family, or whether it was Thanksgiving, or whether it was Christmas. How many of you had an event? Common, universal, shared themes. How many of you had one where you thought about it in terms of it's something that you participate in, that you are part of the making of? Common, universal, shared themes. That's what you start looking for when you're looking across things like the video you're going to be looking at. How many of you think they have such a unique story that nobody else has something? Nobody else had it in the room. Of course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Go for it. The unique story of my favorite meal uh -huh. is every Christmas my family has for Christmas chili dogs. Our Christmas meal is chili dogs. And, and I think we're probably the only people to do that. And it's because my mom made a big ham and we didn't eat it. And she goes, what do you guys want? And my brother said, chili dogs. <laughs> and so now the tradition of my family is chili dogs for Christmas morning. I mean, by like 10 a.m. By like 10 a.m. <laughs> Who else has a unique story? A story that they think nobody else shares. They like chili dogs for Christmas. Um, my aunt like, makes homemade bread all the time and it's really good. And she lets us help her. So you've got the helping, you've got the regularity of it, you've got the homemade bread, which you're right, doesn't happen very often anymore. We take raw meat and we don't pick like preformed hamburgers. We take raw meat and we just like put the seasoning with it and then turn it into patties and grill it. So you can give it yourself the pre prepared thing. Right. This good recipe in this family tradition. It's this way in which you experience the opportunity. I lost. The, who's the ice cream looking person? I just lost you. Um, ice cream was cool, but what I'm hearing you talk about is your grandfather. And what I'm also hearing you talk about is the fact that you got this and your sister didn't, and you're neener, right? <laughs> so there's this piece that goes along with this. We want to sort of start looking at data, and you can look at something as simple as favorite meals and say, "Listen, we can talk about this in a variety of ways." This idea of gender makes a difference. Not shockingly to any of you in this room, boys experience the world differently than girls. Women experience the world that you're not. Yes, of course, right? Women experience the world differently than men experience the world. None. Not that it wasn't any of your stories, but none of you raised your hand and said, my dad and I make this. Cooking stories tend to be remarkably gendered. They tend to do with grandmothers. They tend to do with moms. Some of them, in fact, do with dads. And I'm not saying it's like you're completely weird and you're a total outlier if you have one of those. But there tends to be this kind of gendered story. Your mom finally gave up on all of you. Right. She tried to please you all this time, did what she was supposed to do, produced the Hallmark Christmas, and she gave up, and now you have this. Those, story, those are stories that are linked to gender. My guess is that when you do your videos, you're going to find some cases where the stories people tell you about school are going to be completely bound by whether or not the person on your video is male or female. It's something to pay attention to. Um, we'll talk about interpretation in a minute. Um, class makes a big difference. I'm go you're going to definitely see this. You're all pretty much from kind of the same area. That's the way we educate kids, right? You know, same geographic area, you all go to school in the same place. What you're going to find, what you find though, when you do this a lot, is that how people grew up, in this case at least, and the ways in which that meal was served have a lot to do with whether or not they were rich or poor, whether or not they 
were part of this large, long, extended family or whether it was just a small group of folks. Social class makes a difference. When you look at your videos, you're going to see that. You're going to get very different stories from folks who go to private schools, folks who are homeschooled, folks who go to public schools in cities, folks who go to public schools in rural areas. You're, those are going to be differences that may not be important to you. Sometimes things become informed by race or ethnicity. I do this a lot with grad students, so um, I get a lot of folks to talk about the traditions and the culture from which they came. <coughs> and how the particular thing that their grandmother made wasn't so much tater tots, but it was falafel or it was you know, matzo ball soup or one of those kinds of things. And ultimately, setting in context makes a difference. So one of the points about when you're looking at data is to look at the ways in which you can start thinking about classifying it. Because if, if you classify it, you then have a way to interpret it and talk about it. Classification matters. So we're going to keep coming back to that. Okay. Here's the heavy lifting for today. We can go over this a thousand times, you never have to see it again. How many of you have had a regular basic science class ever in your life? That should be all of you. Um, if you don't think you have, see me afterwards. Um, or see Mr. Koza. Really. <laughs> the way kind of basic bench science chemistry, biology, physics is thought to go, and in some ways survey research, so social science is going to do this as well, talks about this idea that we call a positivistic lens. You can have this later. The label isn't important. What it says, though, is the fact that you can be separate from your research. You can be objective about your research. <coughs> What you think or feel about something shouldn't matter. That's sort of a basic stance to research. It's this idea that we can set up barriers, firewalls, filters, from which the researcher, you, the scientist, could not possibly affect the outcome of your study. And so we have control groups. Everybody had the lesson of control groups? Control group makes sense? Variables make sense? The idea in sort of positivistic science is that you try to control as much as possible. The good news about what we're doing here, it's all post-positivistic. None of that matters. We're not trying to control anything. We're putting a prompt out. You're putting a prompt out on the internet, and you're going to get what you get. And the lovely thing about looking at this through this post-positivistic lens, it assumes that worldviews are going to be different, and it assumes things are going to shift. You know, it doesn't matter where I teach. <laughs> the phone rings, the phone to the lawnmower, you know, there's always something. The other thing is that it assumes that knowledge is unpredictable. That what you're going to get back is very, very random in some ways. That everybody's story is going to be different, much like your food stories were different. And so the idea here is that experience matters that the ways people experience things, how they participate, oppose, stay silent, be, are part of those experiences, are very, very different for everybody. So think for a second about um, a football game. How many of you ever been to a football game? Ooh. OK. If you've never been to a football game, imagine what a football game might look like. If you've ever seen Friday Night Lights, that counts too. What's the experience of the person on the field? It's not the hard question, folks. Uh, nervous sometimes? Absolutely. What's going to happen? Intense, absolutely. Excuse me? Excitement, absolutely. <coughs> yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's a sense of aggression, there's a fierceness to it. What else? Pressure. Pressure? Pain? Sorry? Adrenaline. Adrenaline. All of those things. Now, talk, now think about, think, so we talked about somebody on the field. Now think about somebody sitting on the bench. Players sitting on the bench. What are the, what's that experience like? Anticipation. Anticipation. Excitement. So some of it's the same. I heard excitement from somebody on the field. What else? Fear. Fear. And fear of, am I going to go in and what's going to happen, or am I never going to go in and I'm just going to spend the rest of the time sitting warm on the bench? Both of those are two different types of fear, right? 
Let's work our ways out. Think about the cheerleader.